Hi folks, I'm back from the Greater New York Dental Meeting. I had a wonderful time there and it was a very productive meeting. Now I met with some of the Rewild Dental faculty and also ran into some of you guys, our members, viewers, and friends on the social media who shared many kind words of encouragement. Now, many of you told me how much the videos that I make have been helpful to you, improving your clinical skills and helping with your patients. Now, I love hearing that and I'm also very happy happy that the effort that I'm making here is helpful to you. Now what's funny is that I also ran into one of the members who asked me why is it that most of the case-based learning videos that I have done so far are on mandibular molars and not any on maxillary molars. So after I looked back at some of the old videos I realized that it's true but I also realized that this is probably because it's much easier to record these videos using direct vision versus using a mirror for uh, you know in maxillary molars or teeth. And while I'm a one-man band shooting, lighting, editing, doing the graphics and the drawings, the sound, uh, the actual presentation, and also doing the actual surgery and the surgical treatment all at once on my own, I guess that I had probably subconsciously uh, favored the mandibular arch over the maxillary arch in that way. But it's never too late. So uh, I left New York for Boston Monday night uh, and it turned out that my first patient the following morning at 8 a.m. on Tuesday was actually a maxillary first molar. So I decided to record and share that case with you. So. Let's take a quick look at this maxillary first molar. Okay, this patient was referred for root canal therapy when one of my referring dentists attempted to do the root canal uh, therapy due to emergency pain on this patient and this tooth and found both buccal roots calcified and unable to access. Now, when you get a patient who's already had a previously started root canal uh, by another practitioner, it's very important and also quite wise to take fresh radiographs, including a couple of angled shots, as well as an additional bite wing radiograph prior to starting the case. This helps you see the extent and orientation of the previous access preparation and also helps you in access reorientation to find the calcified canals. The bite wing here shows us that the axis is not impinging on the furcal floor and it also indicates that it may be slightly leaning towards the mesial but it also shows us that the canals are present and appear to be close by. The mesial buccal root appears broad and an MB2 was suspected as a result of this broad root. A CBCT wasn't indicated at this time as the standard radiographs appeared adequately diagnostic for these purposes. Now an estimated working length of 22 millimeters was determined and the area was anesthetized with two carpules of 4% articane with a PSA block and a buccal infiltration. The tooth was isolated for access preparation. As you can see, the old restorative material had washed out. I removed the provisional cavit using the saber cut burr from the Rewild Endo Access Kit. And when the base of the cavit was near, I switched to the Forza V3 ultrasonic with the E9D tip to remove the rest of the cavit and the cotton. Now this helps avoid getting the cotton tangled up in the rotary burr. The access was cleaned and it was washed thoroughly. As you can see, only the paddle canal had been found and the buccal canals remained hidden after the initial search by the previous operator. Pus was present in the paddle canal. Now this patient's dentist was very smart. Understanding when to refer a patient is an important part of the case triage for successful outcomes. Any further attempts at finding the canal without the use of an operating microscope and clinical experience in these cases would have merely weakened the tooth by removing healthy tooth structure but potentially created a furcal perforation dramatically reducing the overall success of this case. So a smart referral can save you and your patients loss of aggravation and this is why it's very important for you to have a very good relationship with your local endodontist and have a teamwork approach to uh, the oral care of your restorative care of your patients.
Once the pulpo floor was cleaned of all debris, it was completely dried. Drying the floor helps in visualizing the dentinal map. By the way, the term dentinal map was coined by Dr. Gary Carr in early days of endodontic microsurgery, and it refers to the difference in color and characteristics of the kind of dentin that is present, which is uh, at higher magnification, it can help you differentiate between the lighter primary dentin and the darker secondary and reparative or tertiary dentin, as well as the furcal dentin. So differentiating between the secondary and primary dentin at high magnification is what allows you to figure out where the dystrophic calcification ends and where you should be drilling or where you shouldn't drill. So this is why the microscope and the proper illumination is so important during access uh, preparation and during the opening into the uh, tooth. Anyway, here the paddle canal was readily present and open for instrumentation. So after a little reorientation, the distal buccal canal was found with the aid of a number two and a number four surgical length round burr on a slow speed followed by the use of ultrasonics. A file was used to determine available length. Now, once the orifice was located, the ESX orifice opener was used to quickly widen the coronal orifice. Here, the size 20 tip and the 08 taper of the orifice opener helps increase the width very quickly and also it aids coronal access to the mid root as well as to the apical third of the tooth. It's important to use short strokes to engagement like SSC or single stroke and clean motion. Or you can use the rhythm motion, which is three strokes to engagement, if you're using the endosync with the OTR motion. Try not to get too ambitious or impatient by pushing the orifice opener too hard, trying to reach a greater depth too quickly. Take what the canal gives you. Now, this means take small bites with your files and let the instruments slide down the canal's natural path. You can never create a path but to take the path that you are given. <laughs> So I always use ultrasonics and water to flush away the debris after using the orifice opener. Once the mesial buckle was found, the same sequence of using a file followed by the orifice opener and then the expediter was used in the mesial buckle canal. By the way, the MB2 wasn't located after an initial search and it was decided to spend more time a little bit searching for it a little bit later on. Now that the upper one third of the canal was opened up, it was time to start using hybridization of tapers, which is a technique that I've described in a previous video that you can see here. So the available length was determined with a small size stiff file, and then it was followed by a sequence of files with the same size tip, but with decreasing taper. Basically, after the orifice opener and determining the available length, I went from a size 1505 down to a 1504, followed by the 1502. These files were used uh, in the rhythm motion on the endosync with the uh, OTR at 300 RPM and an OTR setting of 0.6 Newton centimeter. All instrumentation was done at this speed and OTR setting was uh, used in this case from the beginning to the end. As I approached available length, I connected the endosync to the endosync AI to measure working length using the 1502 ESX scout file. Now as the file achieved length, the file came to a full stop because of the apical stop setting on the endosync and working length were measured after apex was reached and it ended up being 22 millimeters in all canals. Now, once the 1502 reached the apex, the 1504 was then taken to the full working length using the same rhythm motion of cleaning and wiping the file after each rhythm motion of three strokes. And then the 1505 was taken to the apex using also the rhythm motion. Now this alternating sequence of strokes between the 1504 and 1505 um, is really the necessary work for you to get the expediter down to the apex. You need to kind of go back and forth between this 1505 and the 1504 after the 1502 has reached the apex until the 1505 is at the apex. Once the expediter is at the apex, that's the 1505, then each canal can be finished just like the basic protocol for ESX using a single ESX master file. So here we got a size 40 in the paddle canal and 
30s in the buccal canals with thorough irrigation. Just before cone fitting, another attempt at finding the MB2 was made. Now, as you saw, the this axis was leaning a little bit to the mesial, and there is a large dentinal shelf, which is that triangular shelf that is covering the MB2. So after searching in that area, the MB2 was located several millimeters distal lingual to the MB1. Once again, a stiff size 8 file by Brassler was used to locate and scout the canal. Then the same protocol of orifice opener followed by hybridization of tapers was used to instrument all the way to the apex and measure working length and repeated this advanced instrumentation sequence that you saw a little bit earlier in the other canals until the appropriate size master file reached the apex. Matching bioceramic coated cones were then used and a cone fit radiograph was taken to confirm. Now, Please note that you can use one size smaller master cones than your master file if you have a tight canal. Since the actual seal is provided by the bioceramic filler, it's very important to leave room for the venting of the bioceramic around the cone to avoid a vapor lock. The panel or root was very wide and also appeared ribbon shaped. As usual, BC sealer was placed in the coronal half of each canal and was then pushed to the apex using a file. And the BC cones were also coated with biceramic sealer and then they were seated and confirmed to have reached their full seated position and to the full length. Now, additional cones were also placed in the panel or canal to address the oval area of this canal. A trial fill radiograph shows the appearance of a wide ribbon-shaped panel root. This root was instrumented with brushing action in the mesio-distal direction to maximize touching of all walls and cleaning them thoroughly. Hydraulic condensation was performed as described in the other videos that I have shared with you and the axis was then filled with a provisional. The post-operative radiograph shows the wide canal configuration in the paddle route in this four canal maxillary first molar. And we can see that the two mesiobuccal canals joining at the apical third of the root, which is a common finding. This case teaches us that the MB2 canal can be pretty far to the lingual in some teeth with wide ribbon shaped roots. It can also uh, be hidden underneath the dentinal shelf that is on the mesial aspect of the maxillary first molar. It also shows us that we should always do a final exploration of the chamber prior to obturation when we get a clean perspective of the dentinal map after all the content of the chamber have been cleaned and removed and the floor of the chamber has been um, cleaned and disinfected. That gives us a better chance to find any little tiny orifices such as the MB2. We also learned that proper application of an advanced ESX protocol using the OTR works very efficiently and with minimum use of you know, hand files. So here we only used four to five rotary files to complete this maxillary uh, first molar with four canals. This case also demonstrates the importance of good referrals and sending cases to the specialist before a procedural error occurs as opposed to wait until you have perfectification and you have a serious problem on your hands before you refer the patient. Lastly, it confirms why capturing live footage in a maxillary molar within direct vision is so challenging. So I guess I was, you know, right with the subconscious uh, uh, decision to do more uh, mandibular molars rather than maxillary molars. But don't worry, I'll do some extracted teeth for you guys in the future uh, to show and demonstrate the technique that I use for finding the MB2 in maxillary molars. Anyway, let me know your thoughts about this case by commenting below this video uh, wherever you find it and uh, hopefully more on our own website. And if you have questions, don't forget to ask on the Ask the Faculty section portion of our website in the forums area. This is Ali Nase, and by the way, I'm going to change my usual sign out from I hope you found this uh, tutorial helpful to a new and I think more impactful and more important sign out. I'm going to say, I'm Ali Nase, and let's save some teeth. <laughs>